major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Friday, May 29th. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabolsi. From San Diego to Minneapolis, St. Paul, emotions still raw right now over the death of a black man in police custody. The incident sparking some San Diegans to call for a stop to police brutality here at home. More on that in a moment. First, though, one of the officers involved in the death of George Floyd now facing third-degree murder. It comes as Minnesota's governor issues an apology while calling in the National Guard to restore order after public uprisings. Whitney Wilde has more, and we warn, some images may be disturbing. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin has been charged by the Hennepin County Attorney's Office with murder and with manslaughter. The Minneapolis police officer who knelt on George Floyd's neck has been officially charged in his death. This is by far the fastest we've ever charged a police officer. Derek Chauvin was one of four officers fired after Floyd, an unarmed black man, died this week while in police custody. New video has also surfaced appearing to show Floyd pleading with officers, telling them he can't breathe. This new footage emerging the same day the governor of Minnesota addressed nights of unrest that have gripped cities in his state. I understand clearly there is no trust in many of our communities. He urged protesters to act peacefully moving forward. I will not patronize you as a white man without living those, those lived experiences of how very difficult that is. But I'm asking you to help us. Help us use humane way to get the streets to a place where we can restore the justice so that those that are expressing rage and anger and demanding justice are heard. The governor also assured the community they will see justice served for all four officers involved in Floyd's death. Justice for the officers involved in this will be swift, that it will come in a timely manner, that it will be fair. Whitney Wild, KPBS News. A CNN crew covering the protests in Minneapolis was arrested on live television. Okay, do you mind telling me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? So despite having press credentials, reporter Omar Jimenez, his producer and photographer were detained. CNN had a white correspondent reporting live nearby and he was not arrested. The crew was let go after an hour. Minnesota's governor apologized, calling the arrest totally unacceptable. An investigation is underway involving an incident between a La Mesa police officer and a black man, and it was caught on tape. It comes as a local group is renewing its demand for an end to all neck restraints holds, neck restraint holds by law enforcement. Here's KPBS reporter John Carroll. What I tell you? I told you I was waiting for somebody to come here? They right here, bro. Hey, bro, oh, you can't bro, do that. This video was shot on Wednesday at the Grossmont Trolley Station in La Mesa. It was posted to Instagram by a user with the name Lem30. We've learned the man in the video is Amari Johnson. It begins as a La Mesa police officer is interacting with Johnson. We do not know what led up to this point, but Johnson says he was simply waiting for friends. As you can see, the officer shoves Johnson onto a bench. At 40 seconds into the video, the officer handcuffs him as other officers rush into the frame. There are a few more minutes of back and forth before the officer tells Johnson he's being arrested for assault on a police officer and he's taken away. Johnson says he's being charged with both assault on a police officer and resisting arrest. He denies both charges. We reached out to La Mesa Police for a comment. The city provided this news release, which says the officer is on administrative leave while an investigation is conducted. It ends with a quote from La Mesa's mayor. 
The city takes these matters very seriously and consequently, in conjunction with the city managers and city attorney's offices, has already begun the appropriate steps forward to investigate this matter thoroughly and take all necessary actions, unquote. We're, we're warning and, and encouraging the city to take us seriously when it comes to banning all neck restraints in San Diego. Against the backdrop of the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the Racial Justice Coalition San Diego is renewing their demand for an end to all neck restraint holds by law enforcement in the county. They held a virtual news conference via Zoom this morning. Law enforcement has resisted those demands over the years, contending that when the carotid hold is used properly, people simply pass out. But activists like Yusuf Miller say it's far too easy for things to go terribly wrong with deadly results. The carotid restraint becomes the chokehold in the field and people are, are killed in this manner. Miller was joined by other racial justice advocates during the virtual news conference. One San Diego mom talked about her son's encounter with police while he was a 15-year-old student at Lincoln High School. A neck restraint hold was used on him and though she says he was injured, he survived. Then, at nearly 41 minutes into the conference, as San Diego Police Citizens Advisory Board member Samantha Jenkins was talking about the La Mesa video, this happened. The arrest appeared to be problematic as he did not appear from the video that was shown. George Floyd deserved it. Vile racial epithets followed as the meeting was Zoom bombed. The host cut off the meeting seconds later, leaving everyone with a stark reminder of how much work remains to be done when it comes to racial justice in this county and across this country. John Carroll, KPBS News. And now to the latest on the coronavirus in our county. Six more people have died, bringing the total to 266. 140 new cases were identified. Of the more than 4,000 tests conducted yesterday, about 3% were positive. Today, San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner toured a local lab that's working to increase COVID-19 testing capacity. Starting next week, Helix will handle more than 50,000 tests per day. Right now, up to 400,000 tests are run every day across the U.S. It's estimated between 1 and 10 million tests are needed to fully reopen. More than 100 local nurses made it be known they're concerned about staffing and safety at their hospital. They protested outside Tri-City Hospital in Oceanside. They say 65 people have been furloughed, causing staffing problems. Nearly all of our, all of our departments uh, were having to break each other, try to get breaks in. You know, we have emergencies that come in and no float nurses to take care of those patients because all of our nurses are at capacity. And the hospital sent a statement to our media partners, 10 News. It says that they are committed to providing the highest quality patient care and values the contributions of every team member. Tri-City says it continues to meet and exceed all patient safety regulations. The coronavirus continues to hit low-income communities of color the hardest. KPBS science and technology reporter Shalina Chetlani looks at what it's going to take to stem new outbreaks. I see the birds um, and I heard them every day. Joanna Bernal spends a lot of time greeting pet birds in her Sherman Heights apartment these days. She left her multiple cleaning jobs two months ago to have a baby. Barely, we, we survive here with one job, so to have a better living, we, we need to have uh, no, two or three jobs. Bernal immigrated to the U.S. about two decades ago from Mexico. Now her income is almost gone. Many of the jobs she had fell through with coronavirus, and she didn't get a stimulus check because she's undocumented. I have been talking to a counselor about all the stress because um, it's, it's not easy uh, as an immigrant. Now that San Diego is opening up again, county officials will increase testing and start contact tracing to prevent outbreaks. This is where they hire workers who can find infected people and their contacts and ask them to quarantine to avoid spreading the virus. Contact tracing everywhere is key to controlling this pandemic, but people in those at-risk communities may be afraid to give up information. I have actually had family that if they get sick, they don't go to the hospital because at the hospital they ask you for your social security number. If you don't have it, they're gonna think that they're gonna send ice to them. 
Diverse and lower income communities like this one, Barrio Logan, are some of the hardest hit in San Diego. While Latinos make up just a third of the population, they account for over 60% of positive coronavirus cases. Well, one of the most overarching criteria that, that we need when we hire contact tracers is we need individuals who will be trusted by the community. San Diego County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher says the county will be hiring around 500 contact tracers who are diverse and speak multiple languages. But another project is underway to reach out directly to people from communities and train them to be contact tracers. When you're part of the community, you understand the community. That's the whole point of why this is a unique arm of the contact tracing workforce. Hala Madanat is a sociologist and a director at the San Diego State University School of Public Health. About a month ago, the school contacted the county with an idea to train up a group of community health workers from Arabic speaking, Spanish speaking and African American communities. They can feel for them, they can understand what needs they may have. Madanat says when people see a familiar face they trust, they'll be more likely to accept an explanation of what it means to get sick and to infect others with coronavirus. Those barriers are easily overcome when you have a real discussion with people about the potential implications. But in low income and diverse communities like Barrio Logan, coronavirus is just one of many stressors. On a recent afternoon, restaurants are closed, and so a group of men light up the grill and make some chicken tacos on the street to get some business. We love all the local businesses, which, you know, right now, they're struggling to stay open. Roberto Alcantar is head of the nonprofit organization, the Chicano Federation. For our folks right now, you know, they're concerned about keeping a roof over their head. They're concerned about uh, where their next meal is going to come from. In other words, he says anyone who tries to convince someone to quarantine and take another economic hit will find it difficult. The lack of economic opportunities, the lack of access to affordable housing, which then forces multiple families to live under one roof, you know, you're really creating a very dangerous situation for our community. He agrees hiring people from the community is critical for contact tracing, but he says people may not trust the guidance because for years, basic needs haven't been met. So additionally, he says government leaders need to provide more economic support to allow these communities to weather the storm. Shalina Chatlani, KPBS News. More money could be on the way for California's public schools. Here's KPBS education reporter Joe Hong with a look at what it will take to reopen in the fall. Earlier this month, the governor released a revised budget that slashed education funding by upwards of $19 billion. The state Senate's revisions to those revisions restore some of the funding. San Diego Unified School District board member Richard Barrera said it could mean some students could return to school in the fall. Under the state Senate's proposal, uh, it's likely that we would be able to do some form of reopening, you know, on schedule in the fall. Uh, you know, maybe not every day at every school, but we could do some, you know, some reopening and, and again, following the public health guidelines. But the state money wouldn't provide enough to carry out the district's ideal plan of a full reopening, which includes an even earlier start to the school year to help students make up for learning loss. And we would still need some federal relief in order to start, uh, you know, a couple of weeks early, you know, particularly for the most vulnerable students. The California State Assembly will propose its own revisions to the governor's budget and will negotiate with the Senate to reach a final budget. As of now, the Senate has given local school districts some hope. What they're saying is plan on doing some reopening. Uh, and then, you know, if the federal government comes through, let's say in July, then you can do more. Um, whereas, you know, the governor's May revise would guarantee that we can't reopen anywhere, you know, in the fall and would be dealing with cuts. Joe Hong, KPBS News. It's been a hot week, but a little relief is coming. Jeff Cornish has your forecast. Well, I hope you're doing well as we transition into the weekend here in Southern California. We do have some relief coming for those uh, steamy interior deserts. The heat is breaking uh, and those excessive heat warnings will be concluding this evening. Welcome news for many folks there in places like Borrego Springs. Still breezy out there, gusty winds for the high desert. Some areas are seeing winds gusting to 45 miles per hour and with dry air in place. Uh, there is the risk of uh, fire danger that's a little bit more elevated right now. Uh, another uh, concern uh, for the coast, especially north of 
Uh, San Diego, uh, we do have concerns about rip currents this weekend. There is an elevated risk of rip currents and slightly larger waves as well. Uh, the excessive heat warning will be ending this evening. Good news there in Borrego Springs. Uh, in uh, other uh, news, though, we do have some concerns tied to wind in some interior areas. Uh, places to the north like Hesperia and Lancaster. Uh, we're dealing with some uh, gustier breezes there and a wind advisory in, a, in effect for some spots. Uh, overnight tonight, we'll get down to 64 in the city, 60 into Oceanside and around 69 degrees into Borrego Springs. Saturday's forecast, we can see some blue on the map. A little relief from the heat, a big trough sets in. This is a storm system that's going to produce severe weather in the northwest but the heat will persist from, say, Yuma, Arizona to the east. So tomorrow we're back down to 98 in Borrego Springs. There will be some low clouds in the morning. The marine layer will be lurking for the coastline, and it looks more comfortable into early next week with that cooler air prevailing, even digging a little farther inland. So that'll be a welcome change for us. Uh, so there's this disturbance pushing north, running almost directly north or north-northeast uh, from San Francisco up into the northwestern U.S., and the trough sets in, offering some cooler air for many. Now, temperatures are not going to vary too much for the coastline, but there will be extra low clouds uh, into the weekend, especially in the morning hours, mid 70s consistently. Inland areas, you'll notice a bit of a cooler setup for Saturday, 77. Then we warm back into the low 80s into the early part of the week. Mountains, upper 60s, even mid to upper 60s come Tuesday. A little breezy next week, and the deserts get some relief, falling from uh, triple digits down to 98 Saturday and back into the low hundreds but Sunday through Wednesday. I'm meteorologist Jeff Cornish for KPBS News. Council members today approved the framework for a final deal to sell the Mission Valley Stadium site to SDSU. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says it's been a long time coming. San Diego State has been negotiating with the city over the land deal for more than a year and a half. The price of more than $86 million turned out to be one of the easier things to agree on. For several months, city attorney Mara Elliott had warned some of the university's demands put the city in legal and financial jeopardy. After SDSU agreed to some of her terms this week, she said the deal is now a win-win. Our goal is and always has been to negotiate deal terms that are fair, equitable and in the public interest, which is what the voters asked us to do when they approved Measure G. We took the time needed to get the deal right so that San Diegans and future generations are not saddled with a rushed and short-sighted deal that we'll later regret. SDSU wants to close the sale as soon as possible so it can start construction on a new football stadium for the Aztecs. It also has plans to build out the property over nearly 20 years with a park next to the San Diego River, housing, offices, hotels, and educational space. Reading remarks from SDSU president Adela De La Torre, the university's team said the project would revitalize underutilized public land. This land represents a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for SDSU. One that won't just be significant for us, but for all of San Diego. The two sides will now hammer out final language for the official purchase and sale agreement. The city council is expected to vote on that deal as soon as June 9th. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Working parents are concerned they may be putting their family's health at risk by sending their kids back to daycare. KPBS reporter Claire Tregesser with more on this difficult decision. We can make a circle. We can make a circle. Alicia Tembe is a teacher and assistant principal in Encinitas and has an almost three year old daughter named Nina. When our school closed, so did theirs, and that left us with trying to figure out what to do for our childcare. She's been trying to teach classes and run staff meetings from home with Nina underfoot. But a few weeks ago, Nina's preschool reopened for essential workers, which includes Tembi. She would be going to a daycare with a lot of other parents who work in the healthcare industry and working at hospitals and are exposed. Um, and bless them for making that sacrifice, but I wasn't entirely comfortable with sending her to school where she would be more exposed, therefore we would be more exposed. Erin Jacobson has been struggling with the same decision. His three-year-old daughter, Amelia, has been home, but now her preschool is reopening. We talked about it and whether it's the right thing to do for, 
for us and, and for Amelia. And uh, it, it really didn't take us long to uh, zero in on, yeah, we'd, we'd like her to go back. Jacobson says he hates that Amelia is missing out by not being able to play with friends and be around teachers who can give her their full attention. It's heartbreaking on a day like, like today where I was very busy with work, had a lot of meetings on the calendar, uh, a lot of deliverables that I, I needed to try to work on. And, you know, she walks up and she just wants to play. Then Amelia demonstrated exactly what her dad was talking about. Can you say hi? Hi. Did something get really scary? Yeah, snakes on my show. There's snakes on your show? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about we do a different episode? We'll make sure there's no snakes. Ooh, the mystery of the golden unicorn. That sounds like a good one. Right up your alley, right? You know, the general workforce does have to get back to work. Dr. Mark Sawyer is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at Rady Children's Hospital. I think it's a reasonable time to start to relax uh, the daycare restriction along with the other things that are being relaxed, but we're going to need to remain vigilant and see what happens. The problem, of course, is that while most young children may not be particularly vulnerable to COVID-19, they are incapable of practicing proper hygiene to prevent the spread of coronavirus. He says the longer parents can wait, the better it will be because doctors will know more, including about a new COVID-related illness impacting children. Which is quite rare, but quite severe, this inflammatory syndrome. So by June or July, we should have a better idea of how frequent that is and perhaps some ideas about how to control that particular manifestation of COVID. Sawyer says daycares do need to have good sanitary practices. There needs to be a system set up so that sick kids are not being entered into the daycare. We need to try to space people out, which for young children is really challenging. I'll come back and watch it with you in a little bit, okay? You can tell me all about it. Aaron Jacobson decided that while his family can't be completely safe until there's a vaccine, his daughter Amelia's education is too important. That's still probably a year away, and, and I don't know if we can, if that's good good for her e either to, to stay out of school for that long. Amelia will return to her preschool on Monday. Claire Tregesser, KPBS News. More local malls open today with extra safety measures. Westfield UTC, Mission Valley, North County, and Plaza Bonita all have new modified hours. Individual store hours will vary. The malls will be cleaned more frequently, have reduced shoppers, and social distancing and mask regulations. Major tourist attractions from Disney World to the Las Vegas Strip announced plans to reopen. But will Americans travel this summer? SDSU's Miro Kopik weighs in for this Friday Business Report. Vegas is going to open effective June the 4th. Vegas has been a ghost town since uh, the pandemic started. So what are they doing? In opening these casinos, they're really trying to bring, they're, they're changing their, their tune. The world has changed, and Vegas is changing with it. Very different from their old ad campaign, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Um, and, and they're being very responsible because the last thing Vegas needs is to shut down again. So they are reducing the density in the casinos, similar to what's happening here in San Diego with casinos like Barona or Viejas, and the things that Vegas is known for, nightclubs and, and, and spas, those are going to be effectively closed. SeaWorld, Legoland, and the USS Midway all announced uh, yesterday that they had come to an agreement with a uh, opening plan for July 1st with the county. Uh, they're submitting that to the state. If the state approves them, they're targeting opening on, on July 1st, which is just prior to the July 4th weekend, which will be great. And finally tonight, a special tribute to not only remember a local man, but the battle for justice as well. Here's KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando. We are here at Chicano Park, next to the fountain area. We call this the plaza area. Artist Victor Ochoa has been painting murals in Chicano Park for half a century, and he brings a lot of history with him. Even though I was born in the United States, my parents were undocumented. I caught the brunt of Operation Wetback, where, where they, they kicked us out to, to Tijuana. So to me, the issue of immigration as a Chicano 
it's also been continuous. It's gotten worse and worse. So even when we were conceptualizing this mural, we were getting all these images constantly from the drowning of the father and his daughter to the caged children. Ochoa and his team of artists, some of them as students, are fully aware that they are painting a mural about a 10-year-old injustice while fresh news breaks over George Floyd's death while in police custody. How does it feel? It feels that there's a need to have this mural dedicated to this issue. You know, we, we have to have justice and we have to check how these officers are dealing with, with our people. The mural uses freeway arches to create a kind of altar for Anastasio Hernandez Rojas. You know, a lot of us, if we get our green card and we're already, we feel uh, that we're not being harassed by immigration, we sort of forget the issue. And, and I would like to say that the mural sort of refreshes our mind that it's still going on and that even though we have cards or papeles, as they say, there's still the issues going on in the community. So this is something that's going to reawaken that awareness. Work on the Chicano Park mural was delayed because of COVID-19. But Ochoa and his team are back painting and hope to have the 50-foot, two-sided mural completed in August. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you.